Well, I'm excited to announce that on January 8th, we're going to be making a big change to our online ministry at Woodbury Lutheran. We're going to move away from a pre-recorded service to live streaming from our Valley Creek campus. I'll say more about that in a moment. Isn't it crazy to think that all the way back, I think it was on March 14th, 2020, uh, we made this transition to an online ministry at Woodbury Lutheran Church. And there's been all kinds of crazy things that have happened. We kind of laugh when we look back at those very first services and the quality of them. Uh, You may have noticed that along the way, Andre's hairstyle has changed. And in one song, you might have a man bun, and the next one, it's kind of long. We've been trying to put together uh, a worship experience that would bless you and would encourage you as you follow Jesus. And some amazing things have happened along the way. Uh, You all might not know this, and this might be you, but we have people who would consider uh, Woodbury Lutheran to be their home church now who don't even live in this state. Uh, We have folks in Wisconsin and Florida and Texas and other places who join with us on a consistent basis and consider Woodbury Lutheran uh, to be their home. Uh, You may have noticed along the way that these services have been pre-recorded, different bands and different pictures and different services, but again, all uh, with the idea to provide you with a great experience in worshiping Jesus and in growing in your faith. So here's the deal. Starting January 8th, we'll be following our Valley Creek worship schedule. It's currently 9 a.m. and 10.30. Uh, What it means, if you want to watch at any other time, you can have uh, still have immediate access to our YouTube channel. So you can go there to catch any of our services. Uh, But the service for each week, it will only be available uh, on demand at 10.30 each Sunday. Uh, So we'll live stream it at at 9 o'clock, and then it will be on demand uh, on our YouTube page. So if you're watching on a Saturday evening, and you want to still watch at that 5 o'clock time, uh, we will only have the service from the previous Sunday available uh, at that time. And one of the big reasons we want to do this is we've got lots of people that are returning to to in-person worship, and we want it to be a a more authentic experience for you. Um, Believe it or not, it's pretty hard to preach into a camera like I'm doing right now with four other people in the room, but this will be an opportunity to once again uh, hear folks responding, hear some singing, and kind of see what's happening uh, real time uh, in the church. Uh, We'll be getting out more information around this as the weeks come, and if you have questions, you know, ask the the, the worship uh, uh, assistant that's online with you now. You can write a question uh, in the text, uh, call the church office. Uh, email the church office. Uh, We'll be happy to make sure uh, you understand exactly uh, how this is going to work. So you'll log on at 9 a.m. or 10.30 uh, at the live uh, site on our website, or you'll go to YouTube and catch this uh, on demand. Thanks uh, for all the ways that you've been just gracious as we've learned through this, as you've been encouraging, and I, I sure hope that you've been encouraged and will continue to be through our online ministry uh, at Woodbury Lutheran. Uh, Kids, at this time you can head off uh, to KidsLink for a specific teaching for you. This is for students uh, up to about fifth grade. Uh, The rest of you all, you're going to stay around. And as I always say when I'm preaching, make sure uh, you grab a scripture card to go deeper uh, into the scripture. And today uh, we're checking out our second week here in this STARS series. And we are looking at uh, Genesis chapter 15. And it's uh, the Lord's covenant that he makes uh, with Abram. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all the blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own. So one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible uh, promise, this covenant that you made with Abram, that you would make his descendants as many as the stars in the sky. Uh, May that promise bring us hope because it's been fulfilled. 
in the covenant that Jesus made with us on the cross. We're so grateful for you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. And we give you all praise and glory. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Uh, So I remember as a kid uh, hearing about the Hubble telescope and looking at some of the incredible uh, pictures that it brought back from space. And you could see galaxies and stars. And over the last couple of months, I've been hearing about a new telescope, the James Webb Telescope. And I've been learning more about it as some of its pictures have been published. Uh, and maybe you've seen this too. They've, they've shown some of the old Hubble pictures against the James Webb picture. And it's amazing to see how different they are and how much clearer uh, this new telescope is. Uh, I learned that the James Webb Telescope, the, the design for it, started way back in 1996. Uh, it cost over $10 billion to develop. It's six times larger than the Hubble telescope, and it is 100 times more powerful. Some of the pictures that it's been bringing back have been incredible. Here, here is just a, a handful of them. I mean, look at the clarity of this. There's, there's no pollution uh, in the air. There's no polite light pollution to get uh, in the way. Uh, Instead, we get this clear picture out into space that goes on and on and on. You can see the stars and uh, galaxies and all kinds of things, planets. I mean, it's just incredible, these pictures uh, that are being brought back to us. Uh, Now, not many of us have access to the James Webb Telescope. It's not something that's sitting uh, in our backyard. But right here in our very own backyard in Minnesota, we have the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And just a few years ago, the Boundary Waters, or the BWCA, it was uh, said to be, or it was, it was slated as one of 13 uh, dark refuge uh, throughout the world. I think there might be a few more even today, uh, but it's the largest of all these uh, dark refuge. That it just means that there isn't light pollution in them. Uh, it's the largest at over a million acres uh, of land. And in these dark refuge, you, c- you can see the stars Uh, like nowhere else in the world because they're not impacted uh, by light pollution. And so you can see as many stars uh, as as possible. Um, It's said that in our galaxy, the Milky Way, which by the way is is always a cool name, even though I prefer Snickers uh, to Milky Way, uh, the Milky Way has 400 billion, 400 billion stars just in our galaxy Alone. That's, that's pretty incredible. Uh, last week we said that the closest star to us from the sun is like 26 trillion miles away. So you can imagine just uh, the vastness of it. 400 billion stars uh, in our galaxy alone. Um, some really smart scientists that think they know how big the universe is, although I would just say it goes on forever. Uh, they say that there's one septillion stars in creation. That's uh, one plus 24 zeros. Okay, I'm just trying to set up some context for you. Because even in a place like the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, uh, on the clearest of nights, with the least amount of light pollution, with the best vision, um, we're able to see about five or six, maybe 7,000 stars. But actually we can only see half of them at a time because the earth cuts us off, blocks us off from seeing uh, the other half. So just think about this for a moment. Even in a place like this, where it feels like the stars go on and on forever, we are seeing... 5,000 out of one septillion stars. Are you feeling kind of small? It's no wonder that the Scriptures say that creation cries out the glory of God. And like, we don't understand how it all works. And when God created the world and the universe, it could have been, you know, a mature universe. And so it really could be millions of years old. We don't get all those details. But what we do get from creation is the magnificence and the glory, the sovereignty and power of our God. And so it's no wonder then that people have have looked up at the stars over their years and they've tried to put glory and in honor to those stars, and, and maybe you've heard this phrase before, that something is written in the stars. Really, that's, that's an idiom for fate. It's an idiom that something has, is destined to be, that if it's written in the stars, that's just the way it's going to be. That was how it was meant to be all along. That's how it's going to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it. And even as, as those who, who follow Jesus, or are at least interested in learning more 
about Jesus. We might say something like, oh, it was fate that I met my my loved one, or it was fate that this happened, or it was written in the stars that this would happen. But we have to be really careful when we talk like that because it pushes back against some of the things we know to be true as those who follow a personal uh, God revealed to us in Jesus. Like, for example, if we just say it's written in the stars, uh, then we don't have to take any ownership of our brokenness or of the sin in the world because we can just say, hey, that's how it was always meant to be. It was, it was fate that this would happen. It was just written in the stars. Uh, the other thing about this whole idea of fate is it's very impersonal. And because it's impersonal, it doesn't offer us any comfort or any hope because that's just how it was going to be. But as people who are journeying toward Christmas in the season of Advent, waiting for Jesus to come, we believe uh, that our God is a personal God, that he actually shows up in the flesh, that that is God himself breaking into the brokenness of sin in this world, doing something about it so that, so that we can be children in his family. We talked about it last week and that we are the crown jewel of his creation, that he has shown up to crown us with honor and with glory. And we see this even in the words of Jesus. He's talking to his, his disciples and they're all worried and kind of upset and they're fearful. And, and Jesus says, just take a deep breath. And he says, what is the price of five sparrows? Like two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Right? This isn't fate. This isn't some far-off, disconnected deity that just put it all into motion and now, all, now watches at a distance. This is a personal God who shows up in the flesh. The same God who created and set a septillion stars in place knows your name, knows your struggles, knows the number of hairs on your head. In our readings for today, we get a glimpse of how personal our God is. Uh, way back in the book of, of Genesis, uh, we learn about this guy named Abram and his wife, Sarai. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God comes to Abram and he says, Hey, you're going to follow me and I'm going to send you to a land that you don't even know where you're going, but I want you to trust me. And he says, I'm going to promise you, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Uh, at the time, Abram was 75 years old and his wife, Sarai, was 65. And uh, they didn't have any kids. It seemed to be written into the stars. It seemed to be fate that they would never have children. And yet God shows up and says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. In order for that to happen, they would have to have some children. And so isn't it funny, the people who God chooses to work through, uh, they weren't equipped to do this. Uh, they weren't better than everybody else. Heck, they couldn't even have children. God chose Abram and Sarai because he wanted to. And he gets to do that because he's God. And as he chooses them, as he makes this promise to them, it wasn't always easy. And so in Genesis 15, uh, 10 years has passed. And here's, here's the deal. They, they still don't have any kids. And so Sarai, instead of being full with a child, her and Abram are filled with fear. There's doubts. They're wondering, God, when are, when are you going to work? And I think all of us can, can relate to this, right? Ten years has passed and they've been trying really hard to follow God and yet it doesn't seem like he's coming through on his promises and they're waiting and they're wondering. And it's in the midst of this that God, in a very personal way, shows up to Abram in a vision and he gives him three promises. This is so great. He says, do not be afraid, Abram. Promise number one, you don't have to be afraid. I'm with you. He says, for I will protect you. Like I'm, I'm here, I'm present, I'm walking with you, even though it might not feel like it, even though it doesn't look like it, I'm, I'm here. Remember, I put all these stars into place. I, I can do this, Abram. I got you. I'll protect you. And then he says, your reward will be great. Uh, in a very small way, this reminds me of when I was a kid. Uh, I hated to go into our basement. 
I'm sure there's some of you that had one of those basements as well. It was scary down there, like creepy. Uh, The light switch was hard to find. It still is even today. Uh, The furnace made all kinds of snorting noises, loud noises, and I was convinced behind that furnace uh, there was a monster lurking. And so whenever my mom would ask me to go down there to get something, she knew that she was going to have to uh, encourage me and remind me that there were no monsters, that it was safe, and it was always helpful if she would remind me that I would get a reward if I went down there to get something for her. That would make it a little more doable. Hey, if you go down there, I'll give you some of this chocolate cake that I made, or I'll give you some candy or whatever, but I need you to go down there and get this for me. Do you see how God's kind of doing that for Abram? Hey, here, here's the deal. Here's the journey you're on. I know it's scary. I know it's challenging, but you don't have to be afraid. I'll protect you. And remember that great reward that I promise. You will be made into a great nation. But sometimes we need a little bit more. And so Abram says this to God. He says, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Maybe in your life you're saying it this way today. What good are all your blessings? It's Christmas time. I know it's supposed to be joy and Jesus is coming, but what good is all of that when my spouse just walked out the door? What good is all of that when I look at the world around me and it continues to be a disaster? It's getting worse and worse. Our culture is diving deeper into darkness, losing the truth of what you have taught, God. What good are your promises when all of that is happening? What good are your promises when I've lost my health? What good are your promises when I don't even know if you're real? What good are your promises if I'm filled with fear? See, sometimes it wasn't just enough for my mom to say, hey, there's no monster down there. It's okay. I promise to give you a reward. Sometimes she had to drop whatever she was doing and walk down there with me. And that's what we see God doing with Abram. He looks at, at Abram and just, just look at this, this text here. This is so amazing. He, he took him outside. Uh, Some some, uh, versions say that he took Abram by the hand and he led him outside. And he said, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That looks like more than 5,000 to me, by the way. That's how many descendants you will have. Uh, This is an actual photo from the Negev. And that is the area where God spoke to Abram. And just look at those stars. It's almost as if the Lord said to Abram, I will walk into the basement with you. I will show you that there are no monsters. Remember the promise that I have made to you. I am with you. You don't have to be afraid. And then later that night, something incredible happened. Later in this this chapter, after the sun went down and, and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. I'll explain that in a moment. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. You see, God said, I'm not just going to show you these promises in words, but I want you to see them and experience them. And so he made a covenant with him. And back in that time when when people made a covenant with one another, what they'd do is they would cut animals in half and they would spread them apart so there was a path between them. And then they would walk between them together. And it was as if they were saying, hey, if we break our pledge, if we break our promise, if we break our covenant, may it be to us as it has been to these animals. May we be cut in half. May we be slaughtered. That's what what will befall befall us if we break our promise. And so it was the Lord in a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch that passed between the carcasses as he made his covenant with Abram that day, a covenant that would not be broken, a promise that his descendants would number the stars in the sky. And beyond that, he goes on to say that all people on earth will be blessed through you, Abram. You may not have a son now, but you will. Well, fast forward 1,800 years or so to a young woman who finds herself engaged and suddenly pregnant. But here's the deal. 
She hasn't had relations with anyone. And yet she's pregnant. And how does she know she's pregnant? Because the Lord has sent an angel to speak to her and to tell her that she is pregnant carrying God himself. Imagine that for a moment. The fear that Mary was experiencing. How am I going to explain this to my fiancé? How am I going to explain this to the world around me? No one's going to believe me. Heck, I don't know if I can even believe myself. And yet the Lord, in such a personal way, appears to Mary and says, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And in our reading from Luke chapter 1, What we see is Mary responding in the words of what's called the Magnificat, where she's singing the glory of God. She's singing the praises of God. She's gone to visit her relative, Elizabeth. This is so cool. Who also was really old and couldn't have children and yet was miraculously pregnant with a little guy named John the Baptist. And so Mary goes to visit her relative, Elizabeth, and she's pregnant with John. And when when Mary shows up and John and Jesus come into the presence of one another. John the Baptist leaps for joy in his mother's womb, even though he's just a child in the womb because he's in the presence of his Lord. And then Mary busts out this incredible song, the Magnificat. And just notice how personal God is in the Magnificat. In verse 48, she says, You know, blessed be the Lord, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. Again, notice who God uses. It was Abram and Sarai, unexpected people. Here it's it's Mary, a servant girl, a young girl to carry the Savior of the world. And it's not because she's better than everyone. You know, some churches teach that Mary was sinless and perfect. Not true. She was a sinner like all of us. And God said, I'm still going to use you. He took notice of his lowly servant girl. He has done great things for me, she says. He has been with us through the generations. Now keep in mind, God had not spoken for 400 years. And she says, even through that, you have been with us through all generations. And then she goes back to Genesis 15. And she says, he's protected us. And he has blessed us, given us a great reward. And then in verse 55, she recalls the covenant that God had made with Abram. And through it all, she's rejoicing. That Emmanuel, God with us, is living in her. And so I ask you, is all of this just fate? Is it all just written in the stars? Here's the deal. Fate can't offer hope. But Jesus Christ can offer hope. Because he has risen from the dead. Fate can't do anything about our brokenness. Fate can't do anything about our sins. But Jesus has come into the world to deal with our sin, to go to the cross, to pay the price for our sin, to become sin for us that we might be good enough before God, that we might be the righteousness of God. Fate can't do that. Fate is impersonal. But Jesus is personal. He is God with us, the one who set that septillion billion, trillion stars in the sky. Put them in their place. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And he shows up as a child. But he doesn't stop there. He takes our hand and he walks us outside. He goes down to the basement with us. He goes to the cross on our behalf. As Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was filled with fear. Father, take this cup from me if you can. And yet he was faithful to his Father's will. And so there would be no animals that were cut up that day on Mount Golgotha. Instead, the Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus, would be sacrificed on our behalf. As Jesus went to the cross on Calvary, he cut a covenant with us. A covenant that reminds us that we don't have to be afraid, no matter what our circumstances are. A covenant that reminds us that he will protect us because he is with us. And a covenant that reminds us that as children of God, through faith in him alone, no other way, that our reward will be great. 
And so it's in response to all of that, like Abram and like Mary, we've been given a great invitation to believe, to trust, to have faith. I love these words that describe uh, Abram back in Genesis 15, 6. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And then Elizabeth says these words about Mary. Mary, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And that's our invitation today. To believe that our Lord will do exactly what he said and that he has done what he said he would do. He blessed Abram. He's given him descendants. You are one of his descendants through faith in his son. He has blessed Mary For she has been made right before God because she believed Jesus. Not because she carried the Son of God, but because she believed, because she trusted. And so the question for us today is, is, are we going to put our our, our faith, our trust, our belief in, in faith? That it's written in the stars? Or are we going to put our trust, our belief in the one who placed every star exactly where it should be? And yet, who still humbled himself, showed up on this earth to carry the weight of our sins, to die on the cross and rise again so that we could truly not be afraid, that we could live as people who are protected by our great God and as those who will receive the reward of everlasting life. And so wherever you find yourself today, if you have fear like Abram does or like Mary did, I hope that you can hear these words and that you can know the deep, deep love that God has shown you in his son Jesus and that you can truly believe because of what he has done for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful for the sacrifice you've made on our behalf that you did cut a new covenant with us, an everlasting covenant that sealed the deal for the promise that you made with Abram, that again gives us strength and courage to go on. May we be like Mary, singing your praises, rejoicing even in the midst of our fear, knowing that you have reached out to us, your lowly servants, knowing that you have protected us, you've been with us through generations, that your faithfulness is set to repeat. It was for Abram, it was for Mary, and it is for us today. May we see that through our fear and trust you more and more deeply this Christmas season that you would receive all glory and honor, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, it's been great to be with you in worship. Uh, Come on back next weekend. I would love to see you in person. If you are around, we'll be continuing this star series. And then Christmas is right around the corner. All kinds of opportunities to worship It is going to be incredible. I can tell you that. God is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving. And you will be blessed. And now receive this blessing from our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Have a great week.